Um, so um, my name is Sam Peters. I'm so excited to have you here today to talk about neurodiversity and how that can intersect with our corporations and businesses and wherever it is that you're finding yourself working and doing that we can do better at understanding that not only do we need to be more affirming and inclusive for neurodiverse people as well, but there's a huge upside for that. There's, it's not just because we need to be nice or we need to be more caring. It's actually because we're missing out and our, our companies are missing out on something. So I wanna start off by kind of getting some clarification on like what does the word mean? Because a lot of times this is a new word for people. And I'm always reminded of, uh, I was just talking earlier, what's your name again? Fajani. I was just talking to Fajani about how I lived in Boston for two years when I was a newlywed uh, and I was a teacher in Boston Public Schools um, and working in South Boston and it was 2008. So as you can imagine, recession hits. There's a lot of dis unrest in the city. There's a lot of uncertainty um, and that can tend to go alongside with higher crime rates. And so we were instructed by our principal we needed to make sure and let our students know some safe, basically give a safety talk and talk about, you know, things that you can do and know in order to help keep yourself and your, your loved ones safe. Talked about, you know, going with a buddy places, don't go places on your own, stay away from dark areas of the street, make sure that you're, uh, that somebody knows when you're leaving and where, when you plan to arrive, these sorts of things. And, and that, you know, usually violent crime happens from somebody that you know or are acquainted with. 80% of nonviolent crimes are committed by somebody that you know. And so kind of sharing the, that information with them. Um, and I was a special education teacher, so I had lots of students who were neurodiverse, who were autistic and ADHD, things like that. And I learned a very important lesson about clear communication when it comes to particularly uh, autistic people, because one of my students after class said, Mr. Peters, I need to talk to you. I said, okay, come on in, bud. And he came in and he just with the biggest concern on his face, he said, I think, I think it's Uncle Ray. I think it's my Uncle Ray. And I was like, what what's your what do you mean what are you talking about bud he goes he's he's the person that i know he's doing all this violent crime and so <laughs> he thought that i was saying that 80 percent of all violent crime is somebody that you know doing all of it he's on a crime spree around the city so i'm so glad that that student I, i'm so glad that that student felt comfortable coming to me and sharing that with me because otherwise he would have been walking around believing that his uncle Ray or somebody else just on edge all the time. Like, it's somebody I know, I don't know who it is. Um, and so it's just a prime example of, it's important to have clarity of language and understanding what we all mean when we talk about different things, um, particularly for neurodiverse communities. So neurodiversity, um, what is it? Uh, it's a term that describes the natural variations in the human nervous system, brain function. And the reason why this is important is because we need to understand that these are normal variations. These are not, um, these are not things that are abnormal or diseases or need to be cured. Um, these are natural things that happen within the, the human nervous system. So if you go back to your elementary school training and you remember your systems of the body, right? So your nervous system is your brain, your spinal, col spinal column, your nerve endings, and that's your nervous system. So what we need to understand is this is a different kind of nervous system. And that's gonna have all sorts of in in implications as we will see. Um, we also prefer this term neurodiversity because it recognizes that no two brains are the same and acknowledges that people experience and interact with the world in different ways. If you think about it, your nervous system is how you interact with the world. You can't do it otherwise. Um, you won't be able to have those senses and to be able to process that information in your brain and then be able to, in your brain, formulate what you want to put back out into the world and do that. So if that's affected, that affects everything. Um, and it's more commonly associated with a range of neurodevelopmental differences, such as autism spectrum disorder, ADHD, and dyslexia, among some others. And we'll get into more of what the others are. So big, big takeaway. It's not a deficit, right? So the reason why we like the term neurodiversity is because it recognizes that there's nothing wrong with you. Uh, it challenges the medical and pathological model of disability, which tends to view neurological differences as deficits that need to be fixed, right? So, and there's a, there's a place for this model of medicine, right? If there is cancer in your body, your cells are replicating abnormally and they're spreading to places where they're not supposed to be and they're causing a lot of trouble. That's a problem that needs to be fixed. It's not just a difference in how your body works, right? Uh, I mean, it is a difference in how your body works, but it's one that needs to be fixed. It's a problem, right? So um, this is not to say we don't like any medical, we do for sure. 
But when it comes to neurodiversity, it's really important to understand that that's not what's going on. It's not something that's a problem. Um, it also promotes a social model of disability, which recognizes that the, there are barriers created by society and the environment. That's what results in the dis disability or difficulty, right? It's not because my nervous system is wrong. It's because this environment that I'm in was not built in order to accommodate or understand my nervous system. Now, that doesn't mean we don't have hurdles and challenges. And I say we a lot. I have ADHD. Um, and so I identify as somebody who is neurodiverse, which is one of the reasons why it's near and dear to my heart. Um, but understanding that the problem is not with me. The problem is with this environment that I'm having to interact with that was not built for me. Um, and as, as you guys can certainly be well aware, right, there are systemic problems that are discriminatory towards different groups of people, right? And that is true not just for race, religion, cultural issues, but it's also true for neurodiversity as well. Um, and we're going to find out more about the intersections of those things as well. Um, and it also is uh, the, implied, the implied thing behind these two things is that neurodivergent individuals should have equal rights and access in society just the way they are without being fixed because they are equal humans with the right to autonomy and self-determination like everyone else, right? So um, I always give the example when it comes to this of, you know, if somebody has had an accident, and they're paralyzed from the waist down and that's, that's what their situation is. We don't ask them like, when are you going to learn to use the stairs? <laughs> right? Like we build the ramp and we expect that they will always need that ramp and that's normal. And there's no judgment on that person for needing the ramp. And yet when somebody needs accommodations for time or for uh, understanding their executive functioning issues, we, we ask, okay, well, how long, when are you going to fix this? When is it going to get better? Um, and that has a, a big effect on people, obviously. Um, it takes many forms. So this is not an, uh, an all comprehensive list, but these are the most common things that you'll see that will classify somebody as a neurodivergent person. Uh, autism spectrum, ADHD, dyscalculia, dyslexia, Tourette's, dyspraxia. Um, and um, I, th this kind of outlines what those things mean and how they impact people and what kind of the symptoms of that are, the way that you'll see that manifest. But I will let you guys, by the way, at the end of this, I'll have my email. If you want a copy of this slideshow, feel free, you know, email it right to you. Um, so the common things we see, autism spectrum disorder, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, um, and learning disabilities. And I, we don't really even like this term, learning disabilities, learning differences, but it's not quite changed yet. We're still making, trying to make progress. Um, so understanding the way that these things uh, manifest is really important. And we'll talk more about that uh, also later. So it's also really important for us to acknowledge where neurodiversity and DEI intersect because this is a big issue, um, not just among people who are known to be neurodivergent, but people who have not yet been diagnosed or people who have uh, been misdiagnosed uh, or misunderstood. So a lot of times we see that with cultural background, right? There are different there are different levels of comfort with autism or ADHD within different cultural groups, right? There are different levels of understanding within different cultural groups. So people may be coming to you from a culture where either that was never acknowledged or uh, recognized or where that was seen as uh, a terrible thing to have or something that should be hidden and, and not talked about. Uh, you may be having people coming from a background where it's it's embraced and they're totally comfortable talking about it. So understanding where people are coming from in that is important. Gender is huge when it comes to neurodiversity because we know that neurodiversity does not discriminate based on race, gender, religion, sexual orientation, culture. There, the idea that these are normal di diversity things within the human nervous system means that theoretically there should be an equal number of people that are female, that are neurodiverse, that are black and neurodiverse, that are Indian and neurodiverse, that are homosexual and neurodiverse. There should be a, a, a proportionate amount across the spectrum, but we know that that's not the case, right? We know that females are grossly underdiagnosed when it comes to autism, uh, ADHD, that have historically been viewed as male issues. These are things that happen to boys. These are not, women are not autistic or women are not ADHD, which is obviously patently false. And, but what, that hap what happens is oftentimes it's diagnosed as anxiety or you're being hysterical or 
um, no, it's not that bad. You're just not, you're not understanding something or you, you need to work harder. You're lazy. These sorts of things where women are, are experiencing bias when it comes to diagnosis and understanding themselves. Um, so we need to understand that race and ethnicity is also huge. We know that a terrible, terrible discrepancy between the numbers of white boys who get diagnosed with ADHD or autism versus people of color that are grossly underrepresented. And we know that those numbers are higher. And so understanding that these things come into play here, sexual orientation, again, it doesn't discriminate based on that. So, um, and it also doesn't mean that you are neurodivergent, right? There's, 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 uh, there's been a growing um, rumor, I guess, or uh, misunderstanding that if somebody is homosexual, oh, that just, that's because they're ADHD and they think outside the box or they're, it's, it's terribly, um, it's terribly homophobic. But this idea that it's because they're neurodiverse that they have a different sexual orientation, that's not true. Um, and then socioeconomic status, understanding that people have had different access to interventions and resources, a lot of times because they couldn't afford them. You know, I'm a therapist and I specialize in working with neurodivergent children. And I would be telling you a lie if I didn't tell you that I see a lot more uh, white boys and girls in, that, are, that are from high socioeconomic status because their parents can afford to come pay me to do therapy. Um, and so understanding that there's going to be a differences in access to resources and, and, and even understanding among different socioeconomic statuses. And that's terrible. We've got to do better. Okay. So now business imperative, right? So I told you it's not just about being kind and being understanding and compassionate. This is also about what's in it for me, right? What's in it for your company? And I got good news for you there. First of all, it's a competitive advantage. Neurodiversity is not only a DEI initiative, but a business imperative that can drive organizational success. Um, one of the reasons is because there's a huge portion of the population that is untapped potential. Neurodiverse people, study after study, 30 to 40% are either under or unemployed. And a big reason for that is because our businesses and corporations and organizations have not been accommodating or affirming they have not understood neurodiversity and therefore you see that's a huge number of people that are ripe for the taking and gifted <laughs> these are these people have a have an opportunity to really have an upside various skills and cognitive ability that are commonly associated with neurodiversity pattern recognition and analytical thinking um, i tell people all the time if your neurodiverse friend tells you they got a bad feeling and you should get out of there at a party or something like that listen to them because they have been processing data, first of all, at a, at a rate that you don't even, can't even comprehend. And second of all, they have this uncanny ability, nine times out of 10, they're right. If they have a bad feeling that something's about to go down or that somebody's, somebody's got bad intentions or whatever else, they, they may not even be able to tell you why, because it's all happening unconsciously or subconsciously. They just know. It's one of the things my wife hates about me is that I know 20 minutes into the TV show who did it. <laughs> yeah, so I've, I've been forbidden from telling her when I have a hunch um, when it comes to movies and TV shows. Um, but understanding that, that that ability is there, and if you tap into it and you learn to trust it and understand it, then it can be a huge upside. Attention to detail. Um, we see this so often with neurodivergent people where they, you know, you might see uh, a bug or a spider and they see a whole universe. They see the genus and species and what the that spiders die. No, we don't want to kill that when it kills flies or they know everything about something. So they have this amazing ability to pay attention to detail and see things on a very granular level that can be very helpful in a lot of situations. Um, it can be very frustrating in situations too. I'm sure you've all maybe had that coworker or employee who has 20 million questions and you're just like, just implement the strategy, yeah. just do it. Right. But a reason for that is because they have this attention to detail and they do want to know the why. And that's not always a negative thing um, when we can lean into it. They have unique perspectives and outside the box thinking. Like I said, they have a completely different nervous system than the majority of your employees. So they're, all the data that you just showed them, is going to, they're going to process very differently than everybody else. And so they're going to have a unique take on it. And not always, but a lot of times that's, a, that's the right take or that's one that you wouldn't have thought of. Um, so you, we, want, we, we want to understand that. 
Um, creativity and problem solving. I tell parents all the time that come to me with their kiddos that are ADHD and they're just having so much trouble with this impulsivity and they just, they don't think before they do something and eh, it's frustrating. And one of the things that I try to remind them of is that there's an upside to that. There's an upside to that impulsivity that maybe you're not taking into account is that they're tremendously creative people because they're willing, they do things without even necessarily processing or filtering it where a lot of kids will second guess themselves and they won't try to draw it that way or they won't try to sing this note that way. But because they have that impulsivity, they also have this great untapped potential for creativity. Um, and so understanding that uh, is, is important. Um, proven results. So not only is there this untapped potential, not only is there a huge upside to be gained, we have proven on the ground results from several organizations that have implemented neurodiversity initiatives and are reaping the benefits. One example, J.P. Morgan Chase's Autism at Work program, they, they made a more inclusive environment. They were proactive in hiring autistic talent, and then they were, um, they were proactive and um, purposeful about implementing accommodations that would make the workplace more friendly and understanding and compassionate. And what they saw was those employees were 48% faster and up to 92% more productive than their, than their non-autistic counterparts. Who wouldn't want 48% faster and 92% more productive employees, right? Absolutely. And then another example was at SAP, the, a neurodivergent employee developed a technical fix to something. They saw that pattern that I was talking about earlier, and they developed a technical fix that saved them $40 million. Why not give this guy some more responsibility, right? He's recognizing things. Um, also, if you do get the slideshow, this article is excellent. Neurodiversity is a competitive advantage. Um, and it's basically outlining kind of some of the things that, that I'm saying here. But it's Harvard Business Review, very reputable source, and gives some really great examples and case studies. Um, okay, so how do we do this? How do we, let's, you're on board, right? I've sold you. You're ready to do it. What are we going to do? Um, the first thing we want to do is increase education and awareness, right? We can't know about something and have a culture that's accommodating and understanding if we don't first educate the people that we have. Um, I'm happy, shameless self-promotion here, I'm happy to come to your businesses and your corporations and do trainings on this. I would love that. Um, but from top to bottom, that's also important, is under, getting in that executive suite so that they can understand the, first of all, the upside, right? Bottom line, this is going to be good for us. And then second of all, understanding about neurodiversity and what it is and how we can do this. Um, being proactive, okay, you're gonna start with the people you've already got, right? Letting people know, hey, this is our neurodiversity initiative. These are some of the things that we wanna roll out and plan to do. And we wanna be proactive about that. Um, and we wanna be affirming and inclusive for all neurodivergent people. Because here's the thing, you've got people in your organization already that are neurodivergent, but you can't tell by looking, right? It's a nervous system thing. So you're not gonna be, a, we don't have, you know, ADHD written on our foreheads. You might know from behavior that you've observed, you know, over the years or whatever, but you're not going to know just by looking at somebody whether or not they're neurodivergent. So we've got to be proactive in letting them know this is a safe place. These are the things that we're going to do to be more inclusive. If you want to know more about that, if you want to talk with your supervisor about your neurodiversity and how we can accommodate and, and affirm that, please have those conversations, letting them know that that's a safe place to do that. And then following, making sure that you follow through. It's not just a, you know, lip service thing. It's not just a, a training on Thursday and then I'm not going to listen to you on Friday, right? Making sure people are prepared to be proactive about embracing those opportunities. Um, highlighting exceptional achievements of neurodiverse employees. Once you found out who your neurodiverse employees are, when they make exceptional accomplishments or, I mean, you're going to do this for any employee, but recognizing it within the context of them being neurodiverse um, and understanding that that neurodiversity was one of the things that may have enabled them to be able to do that amazing work. Um, uh, allowing for alternate settings and processes for meetings and communication. I, I don't know if uh, anybody in here is neurodiverse. I'm not going to ask you to self-identify, but man, being in a meeting is sometimes the most challenging thing for me because I'm paying attention to Julie's clicking her pen and John's wearing those shoes that stink and he's talking, he's distracted on his laptop and I want to know what he's looking at. And then the boss is also talking, there's all this stuff, right? So there's so many things that make it really, really difficult for me to be successful in a meeting. Um, so um, understanding that and being able to accommodate for those things, like say, hey, would it be all right if 
you send me uh, a recording or a synopsis of the meeting? Or would it be okay if we do this meeting um, in a blind Zoom where I can't see what everybody's doing? Um, understanding that that's not somebody just trying to make an excuse or trying to get out of something, but that that might actually be an accommodation that they need. Um, so now hiring and recruitment. So the first thing that you can do is encourage your organization to partner with neurodiverse people and organizations that are already there in your community. Sponsor a run. Sponsor a uh, go, you know, in, in, uh, give your employees time to go volunteer at the schools or time to go uh, work with different groups of people um, by empowering them and, and, and making sure that your corporation is doing that. Um, being vocal and proactive about informing all potential applicants. Like I said, you're not going to know when they walk in that door if they're neurodiverse. But being proactive on the front end, like, hey, um, I just want you to know that we are an inclusive place for all people, including neurodiverse people, um, and, and singling that out. Because a lot of times nowadays, uh, when we hear DEI initiatives or that we are an inclusive place to work, we think about that in, the term, in terms of race, as we ought race and culture and background and things like that. But we don't always, we need to make sure we also say, and also we are inclusive for neurodiverse people um, because that's going to be a signal to them that, okay, they understood the assignment. Um, no, no, no laughter from understood the assignment. I thought that was like a big meme right now or something. I don't know. Anyway, uh, <laughs> asking applicants what resources or accommodations that may need, they may need before the interview. Like, Hey, maybe they want, they, they would prefer a different, interview style or, or way of interviewing um, being and, and, and again allowing for alternative settings and processes for interviewing one of the things that JP Morgan Chase did with their autism at work was they they did they gave people the option of doing project-based evaluations instead of traditional face-to-face one-on-one interviews where they could actually come in and show what they know how to do working as part of a team working on a project and that was able for them to to be able to actually focus on the work at hand and what I'm going to need to be able to do in this job versus the social awkwardness of the interview and the power dynamic and the nonverbal cues and all that kind of stuff. They could actually just focus on what it was they were going to be doing. Uh, and then hangouts. Uh, another thing, I think SAP did this, but um, having less formal traditional one-on-one -on -one interviews and ha rather having a group of people come in where maybe not even anybody knows who's the boss or interview, but it's, it's casual. We can talk, everybody talks and kind of mingles around you get to know people and you're able to experience what people are like in a more casual, less formal um, interview with all that kind of pressure on it. Uh, the other thing you need to understand is sensory integration, right? We said this is a nervous system issue. Um, this is a nervous system way of being and we need to understand unique sensory needs um, and being willing to accommodate those things oh okay so um and understanding that there's more than just the five senses we learned about in school right there's also internal state uh, balance and movement so there's um what is that called vestibular motion right so um and this is one of the things that i do in my counseling practice my my clients know and i let them know on the front end if you need to stand up and pace while we talk, if you need to sit in my, my spinny chair and spin around, uh, have a swing in the corner, if you need to swing back and forth while we talk, that's okay. Um, because they need that, that's how their nervous system, that's what their nervous system needs. So uh, willingness to accommodate those things. You might have an employee who needs noise canceling headphones because the office that you're in is too loud or they may need a separate space um, where they can go to close off kind of the outside world. They don't want to be in that, you know, for a long time, like open office concepts were super popular. Um, and I remember when the company I was working at at the time did that, and I was like, oh, crap, this is going to it's going to kill my productivity because I'm going to be seeing everything that happens. And it's going to be impossible for me to focus and put my head down and get some work done. So um, if you have that sort of an office design, maybe understanding that they may need a different space to be able to go work or providing them with noise canceling headphones or providing them with a pop-up cubicle that they can pop up, those sorts of things. Um, and also encouraging all employees to be understanding, accepting and accommodating for those sorts of things. Um, and obviously there'll be limitations. There'll be things that you may not be able to accomplish at your workplace, but being able to be understanding and compassionate about that, like, Hey, I get it. So let's, let's work with you to figure out what we can do to help uh, allowing more work from home time. Um, those sorts of things. Um, 
And if you need a guide, this is another link, five tips for creating a sensor-friendly office. It's a good place to start. Sorry if I'm blazing through this, but I, they came in like, I had like 20 sides, slides left in the last one, so I'm trying to make sure I <laughs> make it through it all. Um, and also my brain moves at 1,000 miles an hour, so I apologize. But there'll be Q&A time at the end. Um, respectful communication. Communication is a huge part of any workplace. So understanding um, that communication comes in many forms, including behavior. So this is especially important when it comes to our friends who are neurodivergent because a lot of times there are issues when it comes to being able to formulate and put into language what it is I'm experiencing, right? And so um, especially when emotional regulation is also a big issue within the neurodivergent community. So understanding that people communicate in other ways than just work, they communicate with their behaviors. So maybe at a calm time when somebody's feeling calm, we're, we're good, we're cool, everything's calm. Are there things that tend to happen when you get triggered or when you get activated where you it's very difficult for you to communicate? What can I look for behavior wise that will tell me that you're feeling really frustrated and upset? What would what would I see behavior wise that would tell me that you need some quiet time alone so that you can communicate that with me without having to do it on my terms? Let me come and meet you where you're at on that. Um, so being able to have that conversation with people. Um, Respect and facilitate all forms of communication. I would prefer it if my one-on-one -on -one could be done via messenger because the, the social aspect of having a one-on-one -on -one sit down face-to-face -face is insanely stressful for me. and It's hard for me to actually hear what you're saying to me. Um, or um, I would prefer if we could have... Uh, if we could, if we could have one-on-one -on -one face to face, because a lot of times I don't get the seriousness of it if I can't see your face and understand it. So you you may have all sorts of different um, types of preferences for communication. Um, support or support them in, to communicate in the way that's most authentic for them. A lot of times uh, there there are many uh, autistic people who are nonverbal. They they don't speak, but they're brilliant. It has nothing to do with their intelligence um, or even their ability to use language, but they need to use a communication device in order to communicate with you. Or um, they may prefer ASL. You may have uh, non-hearing people. I mean, that's something we've accommodated for a long time. But um, there are also people that, do, that can hear and that can speak, but they still prefer to use ASL because of all the tone of voice changes and things like that. It's very, it can be very off-putting. So being able to try to accommodate those things whenever you can. Um, this is a big one. Avoid enforcing neurotypical communication expectations when you can. There's a lot of unspoken expectations we have that may, we're not even necessarily aware of until they're not done. So um, understanding that eye contact can be very, very difficult for people with neurodivergences. Um, and then there are other people that are neurodivergent where they want intense eye contact. Um, and that can get awkward sometimes, but they want that. So understanding that there are some expectations you may have in terms, and firm handshakes is another one. Your sense of touch is a big sensory issue that a lot of, there's a dysregulation. Uh, and so a firm handshake may feel like somebody stabbing them with a knife in their hand because it's that they're that sensitive to that sort of thing. It's not a disrespectful thing for them to not want to shake hands or give hugs. Uh, sitting still is a big one as well, especially ADHD. Um, being okay with, if you need to move around while we're having a meeting, that's okay. I know that that doesn't mean that you're not paying attention. Maybe that means you're actually paying better attention because you're moving around, uh, understanding those things. Uh, using clear, direct language as much as possible um, exaggerations can really get lost. Sarcasm gets really lost a lot of times. Um, visual aids. So that if there's a process that needs to be done, if there's a visual version of that, not because they're illiterate, but because they understand visual better than they understand text or language. Um, and then being able to break up ideas into smaller bits. Um, one of the issues that, that creeps into when it comes to the, the brain functioning of ADHD people, for example, is if you tell me a process and it's got 12 steps in it, I'm going to get lost at step three because it's too much um, for me to be able to remember in my working memory. Um, and so being able to break it into smaller bits and chunks so that I can understand it better um, or, or maybe even giving it to me in writing so that I see all the 12 steps and I'm less likely to miss one. Uh, operative social interaction. So understanding that we need to support our neurodivergent employees in their social uh, interactions 
and enabling them to connect with people with appropriate communities and groups around areas of special interest. I mean, how many of you guys in your offices, you have the group of guys that's always going to talk about their fantasy football teams on Monday, right? And we accommodate for that. We understand that. We don't have a problem with that. Well, why would it be any different for a group of autistic individuals that want to talk about the Titanic? Because that's their special interest, and they know everything there is to know about the Titanic. Let's accommodate. Let's make space for them to have those connections and those conversations and not think that that's any different than the guys wanting to discuss their fantasy football teams. Um, or the ladies, if you guys play fantasy football. I don't mean to discriminate based on gender. Um, but uh, And then, ag again, educating all employees about different neurodivergent styles of thinking, feeling, socially communicating, and interacting um, so that they understand that, no, John's not being weird when he won't make eye contact with He's not embarrassed about anything. He just, that's something that is really uncomfortable for him to be able to do um, and to not judge people based on that. And then this is another big one. Avoid those neurotypical assumptions about what an employee's social wants and needs should be, right? I don't know how many times I've had to have this conversation with parents about, you know, he doesn't have any friends. He sits alone every day at lunch. And that's always my first question is, are, do you sit alone at lunch because you want to? Or are you sitting alone? Are you feeling lonely? And you want to sit with other people because a lot of times that I don't want to eat with anybody. I, that, uh, that sounds terrible. I don't, that, that would be the worst. So they want to be alone and that's okay. They have different social wants and needs or why don't you ever go out with everybody after work for a drink? That might be the worst environment imaginable for them. And, and maybe they don't, they prefer to have boundaries on not having the, the work social overlap because it's very it can be very confusing for a lot of autistic individuals and, and neurodivergent individuals and so being able to say hey it doesn't mean that they're mean and or cold it means that that's that's how they operate best and that's what they're want th are their needs being met that's my question always because if they are feeling lonely at work if they're feeling disconnected and they're discouraged by that then yes let's empower them to make connections to do that but let's not assume that they want to have that and try to force that on them um, environmental, environmental emotional regulation. So understanding that there is a very, very strong connection for neurodivergent individuals when it comes to their sensory integration and their emotions, their feelings. Um, and this is true for all people. Obviously, there's always a connection between what you're, what's going on in your sensory, what you're, uh, what you're sensing and feeling and how your emotions are. But it's especially strong and powerful because of that sensory integration issue. A lot of times I tell people all the time that when it comes to um, emotional regulation, um, neurotypical people have like a volume knob for anger and, and sadness and things like that. Neurodivergent people oftentimes, they just kind of have an on and off switch. <laughs> if I'm sad, I'm all the way sad. And if I'm not sad, I'm not sad. Not even close. And so those degrees of gray, those shades of gray, oftentimes are very difficult for neurodivergent people to access. So we need to understand that so that we understand that just because they are having a large emotional sensation right now, it doesn't mean they're overreacting. It doesn't mean they're underreacting. It means they're, they're having their feeling the way that they have their feeling. And it also means that they might be fine in 10 minutes if I just give them some space to self-regulate. Does that make sense? Like just because somebody's having a meltdown right now in this moment doesn't mean that they're going to be in five minutes time. That's oftentimes uh, something that is stunning to neurotypical people is how I can be so upset one moment and then I'm fine five minutes later because I just needed to have that emotion and express it and get it out. Obviously, you want people to be safe. You don't want people to be disrupting other people's work situations. But but understanding that emotional regulation is a big difficulty when it comes to neurodiverse people. So creating a supportive environment, and again, this is where you can ask about that behavior is also communication um, that fosters emotional well-being, taking a proactive approach to meeting those sensory needs by empowering employees to build and maintain like a sensory toolbox. You can have fidgets at your desk. You can have the, the spinny chair or the workout chair. You can. There, we've created this room where there are different sensory experiences that you, there's a swing in there or there's a, a deprivation pod, I think was somebody mentioned, um, and understanding that those things and being proactive about making those things available to people. Routines and structure. So established routines can provide security, comfort, and predictability for employees who may find some tasks difficult. So being flexible on allowing people to create 
um, different accommodations for traditional work tasks, schedules, and environments, um, and being flexible on those things. So for instance, uh, work from home is a big one because a lot of times neurodivergent people um, have done way better in pandemic, for instance, because they were allowed to work from home and they were allowed to control their environment for what their sensory needs are. Um, my wife is one of these. Um, it's been a huge upside for her to work from home and she's been incredibly more productive because she's been able to control her environment more um, and be able to meet her sensory needs in a way that's that's more cohesive to her or conducive to her work. Um, and then consistent and clearly communicated expectations uh, and routines can help reduce anxiety and burnout. So when people know this is the routine for this, because a lot of times there will be things that are unspoken that are just kind of absorbed by osmosis through through neurotypical employees, like they just know that they need to get back to you by five o'clock on that email. It was never maybe clearly expressed or whatever. We need to make those things that are uh, non, that, that aren't verbalized, we need to make them transparent. We need to make them, and we need to be, uh, because obviously we're not always gonna catch them because sometimes the neurotypical person doesn't know that they've been making an assumption until, until five o'clock rolls around, why haven't I heard from you? Um, and so instead of getting upset or reprimanding that employee, having a discussion about, hey, I, don't, I, I guess I've never said this out loud, and I apologize for that, but it is the expectation that you will answer by 5 o'clock or that you will let me know that you're not able to answer by 5 o'clock so that you're clearly delineating those things that may have been obvious to you or other neurotypical employees. Um, visual schedules, again, as much as possible, um, can help a lot of neurodivergent individuals with transitions when they see something's coming on a timeline. Um, because a lot of times we have difficulty visualizing a timeline internally. A lot of us struggle from what's called time blindness, which is where I just don't even know what time of day it is. It's not that I don't cognitively know, it's just that it's not, it's not uh, obvious to me. Or that I won't realize that I've been working on this for an hour and a half and I should have just been 30 minutes. I, I, I'll kind of lose track of time in that way. Um, Changes to established expectations can be very difficult. So as much as possible, if you're going to be doing fire drills, if you're going to be doing lockdown drills or any kind of break in the schedule and there's a there's some sort of planning that's taking place around that, involve your neurodiverse employees in that process because they'll be able to, first of all, have that kind of advanced warning that this is going to happen. And they'll also be able to have, feel like they have a certain level of control over it as well. Um, and they may have insights into things that you may not realize, like, we don't want to do that from three to five because that's when Doug over there is plugged in. Like he's, he is in the zone and you don't want to mess with that during that time period. Can we move it to two thirty, and that way we can get it done beforehand. So they may have insights into that that you may not realize. Um, and that's a link to some visual schedules on Google that is underlined. Uh, effective communication strategies. So I'm going to, um, let me go a little bit faster. Let's see. I think we're coming up on time. So, I'm going to put them all up here and kind of highlight some things. So uh, active listening uh, is important to, again, verbal and nonverbal communication, behaviors or communications. Um, understanding that, that we want to validate their feelings and experiences even when they're confusing to us, right? So we may not understand why somebody has a certain reaction to something, but we need to start with validating. I, again, I'm a therapist, so I'm a little bit biased, but I tell people all the time, there's no such thing as a wrong or right feeling. A feeling is a feeling. You have it. So validating that and be like, oh, okay. So I'm, I'm hearing that you were really confused by that or you were really upset by that. Um, help me understand what was so upsetting about that so that we can try to work on this. So taking the time to validate before and, and to clarify any confusion from the perspective of there's something I'm not seeing, not you're way off base about this or you're overreacting or whatever else. Um, and that's true even when adjustments may need to be made for their actions or expectations, right? It's possible for a neurodivergent employee to underperform, to not hit their KPIs or whatever it is that you're looking at. So um, even if they're the ones that need to make adjustments, then we need to be val we need to validate their experience of those things and, and understand that um, just because they feel like that's too much to expect from them or whatever, if I'm not going to be able to adjust for it, I still need to be able to understand. I can understand why you feel like that's too much, but unfortunately I don't have the flexibility. 
So, so we need to work this together to figure out how we can help you to do that in a way, in a way that is doable for us. Um, and then on the flip side of that, being willing to adjust your actions and expectations when you can, right? When, when that's appropriate. Using clear and concise language uh, as much as possible. Avoid figurative language or sarcasm or like you've got, you know, you need to, you need to do a marathon of emails or things like that that, that, that are, may not make sense at all to uh, the person you're communicating to. Um, and they're difficult for them to catch a lot of times. Uh, understanding that neurodivergent people, some, tend to be very direct in communication in ways that neurotypical people might find rude. But they're not, that is not the intention at all behind what they're saying. Um, and it, again, it doesn't mean that you might have some conversations with neurodivergent people to help them understand that, that, why that's perceived that way. But it also helps a lot if you can, if you can uh, lessen the level of offense that is taken on the front end, right? It makes that conversation more likely to be able to happen. Um, and a lot of times too, it, it also saves you from making an inaccurate assumption that they hate me or they, they were purposefully being mean to me and now I'm going to treat them differently when that was never what was intended by that. Um, even though that may have been a violation of a social norm, but they, they may not have realized that. Um, providing resources and guidance to help both neurotypical and neurodivergent employees navigate mutual understanding and reconciliation. So if you have an issue where so-and-so came to me and they're saying that, that Jimmy in accounting is being very rude to them and very disrespectful, and you know that Jimmy in accounting is autistic, and that, that may not be his intention in those cases. Now, that's not to say neurodivergent people are capable of also being mean. So, um, but let's take some time to dig into it and understand, right? And let's foster communication so that we can reconcile if that's not what was intended. Instead of saying, oh, he didn't mean it, and just letting it go, let's actually help these two reconcile because we don't want to have that, that misunderstanding between them. Uh, understanding visual aids are super helpful. Again, I think I've said that like 12 times already, sorry. Um, alternative communication methods. So being willing to explore such as sign language or picture exchange systems. I've had so many of my clients tell me that they could tell me how they're feeling a lot better with a GIF. <laughs> so, okay, go for it. You can tell me that. If you need to put together some GIFs to show me how you're feeling about this thing, or if you want me to send GIFs to you that reflect the mood that I'm in, um, then we can communicate in that way. Uh, obviously, there's going to need to be some clarification. You can't entirely communicate with gifts. But if that's a preference that they have and they understand that more, then yeah, let's use that. Um, or uh, again, we've talked about it, if they prefer written one-on-one -on -one type feedback um, versus in person or vice versa. Uh, explore messaging and texting as appropriate vehicles for what could be more emotionally charged conversations. So if you're needing to have a difficult conversation with an employee, letting them know, first of all, on the front end, we do need to have a difficult conversation. So verbalizing that because they may not pick up on those nonverbals a lot of times. You know, you, you know, you know when your boss is coming over to have a serious conversation with you, they may not. They may not realize that at all. And so it can be very off-putting. And if they know that on the front end, they might say, I would prefer to have that over email so that I can have time to contemplate and truly digest what you're saying and have a tempered and purposeful thought out response to it um, and allowing for that to happen. Um, because uh, a lot of times we, a lot of times I think it's probably, you know, HR cover your butt sort of thing. They want you to have those conversations in person so that you're not putting anything in writing. But um, being understanding that some people that's, that's the worst way for them to communicate. And so if they tell you that they do prefer it to be in writing, then, then do that. Um, it helps them to have the time to process it. Uh, recognizing communication may take more time. Um, being patient and understanding, providing encouragement and support. On your guard about disparaging and demeaning remarks. Um, so how do we manage performance with that? So understanding rejection sensitive dysphoria. Is anybody familiar with this term already? So uh, what this basically means, dysphoria is like um, overwhelming feeling of something to the point where it shuts you down. Um, and one of the big reasons for this, and um, the, one of the big reasons for this is because one of the studies, or, well, several studies have been done on this, but we know that by age 12, a neurodivergent child has heard over 10,000 more 
disparaging or demeaning statements aimed at them. Why are you so lazy? Why can't you do this? Why can't you do this? Very critical things. Cool. Um, gave me the one minute. All right. Um, so understanding that that creates a situation where they are very, very sensitive to even perceived rejection. So understanding that, that that's a real thing and that's something that these that a lot of neurodivergent people are very sensitive to means we should be very careful about that and understanding and also just having a conversation at a non heated moment or whatever, is that something that is going on with you? Do you feel like you, that, that you are very sensitive to rejection? And how can I be more accommodating to that? Um, so understanding that and focusing on abilities rather than their deficits as much as possible. Using language of identity. So this is really important because of this rejection sensitivity. Um, language of identity is something I developed more for parenting, but I, it very much applies in the workplace. And what that means is that before I get into the thing that's going on that we need to work on or correct, I'm going to affirm what I know about you. I know that you are an honest and straightforward person. I know that you're a valuable asset to this company. And that's why I want to talk to you about this issue, because I know that this is who you are and that's who you want to be, because it helps them create some separation between mistake or bad choice and their identity as a person. So, um, Making a plan, collaborate with them as much as possible because they're going to have buy-in, positive reinforcement. is This is true for all people, not just neurodiverse people. It's going to have better practical results, better for mental health, better for connection and relationships. Um, time blindness, I think I already talked about. Say yes as much as possible. Any questions? <laughs> Anybody? I, I yes. Do. Sorry, I rushed through that last no, bit no, there. It's it's, I'm still focused on your untapped. Actually mentored this young lady. She just graduated college and she was in the time of her job. Yeah. And the question that she asked me was based on her experience in college when she had a work story. Mm -hmm. She said, um, Patrice, should I divulge in my interview that I'm neurodiverse? And her thinking was, because I don't want to set myself up for failure mm -hmm. if I get hired into this role and they don't understand my needs. Yes. And I didn't know how to answer that question. The best answer that I could give her in that moment was I actually told her not to. I said, yeah. because you're yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So I and that's a that is a big issue that I face with my individual clients a lot. One of the reasons why I wanted to start doing this work is because I wanted to have a broader impact. I was so it gets so exhausting having so many of my clients come in with the same issues that they're seeing at work. Um, and so one of the big issues within the neurodivergent community is masking. Have you heard of this term? Masking meaning like you're you're pretending to be neurotypical. You're pretending to be um, n normal, so to speak. And the way that I work with my clients on that, which is the same thing that I would probably tell this person, is I am not one of those people that thinks you never mask ever all the time. You be 100% authentically what you feel, what you think. I just don't think that's sustainable for anybody, neurodiverse people or neurotypical people. Um, because we're living in a society, right? Uh, and then on the flip side of that is you should always mask and you need to be better. You need to fix what's wrong with you. So I'm not on that end either. My philosophy is if you're masking out of love, concern, care for others, then that's an okay thing. If you're masking out of a desire to protect yourself personally for your own safety, emotional or otherwise, then that's an okay choice for you to make. If you're making that decision out of shame about who you are and out of um, an attempt to uh, make yourself be something different that you're not, it's probably not going to be very healthy for you. Um, so in this situation, I, I, a lot of that depends. And that's why I really advocate for companies to be proactive about letting uh, people know that they are. But in this kind of interim period where we don't always have that, it's kind of a, it's a case by case basis. Um, and that's a decision that only she can make really. But that's kind of the background of what I would say. We ready? Yes, sir. All right. Thank We're done. So much, All right. And like I said, this is, this is my email. If you want a copy of the slideshow, send me an email. I'll say slideshow, please.